Great. Thank you all for joining us today. My name is Alan Hasse. I'm a vice president here at Avaya responsible for our unified access products. So we're really excited to have you all here today. We're going to talk about three things. We had three exciting sections for you. I'm going to kick things off and give you just a really brief overview of Avaya. And I'm really going to kind of do three things. One is talk kind of about what you may think about Avaya when you hear us. Uh, the second is hopefully give you a different impression about Avaya, especially as it comes to networking and wireless. And finally, I'm going to close it with showcasing one of the highlights that we've had recently, which is our deployment at Sochi. I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. Then I'm going to hand it off to Paul and John, and they're going to talk about what we're doing to truly unify networking technology, right? So if you think back in the industry, wireless has largely been an overlay system for quite some time now. It's all, you know, the underlying network really didn't solve all the problems that wireless needed to. And so the industry kind of adopted it as an overlay system. So we think we're doing something really compelling here by collapsing wired and wireless into a truly unified network. So we're gonna talk about that. They're gonna talk about how our fabric technology enables that. And then they're actually gonna talk about some some of our more recent innovations around fabric attach and how we can automate the onboarding of users devices and even a wireless system and automate the provisioning of not just the edge of the network but the core of the network as well with this technology and then finally, Gianti and Vamchi are going to get up here and talk about our wireless system in particular. They're going to go into kind of the completeness of the solution. They're going to highlight some of the innovations that we have in differentiation around our access points and radio technology. And then they're going to close with application control and what we can do with helping users and IT administrators get a better user experience through having a deep understanding of the applications that are being used. So with that, let me dive in and talk about Avaya. Now, many of you, when you hear about Avaya or think about Avaya, you probably think about it as maybe first as a contact center company. And it's true, we're a contact center company. We're the industry leader in contact centers. Uh, and if you don't think about that, you may think about us as a unified communications company, and that's also true. We're an uh, industry leader in unified communications as well. We have an incredibly broad customer base and a very large channel, and, and are quite a large company as it relates to that. But what you may not know is that we actually have a very healthy and robust and growing network business as well. And over the last several years, we've delivered a number of innovations in the market. So as you might imagine, being a contact center and unified communications company, we've done a lot of interesting integrated solutions where we've taken our networking technology and our collaboration and contact center systems and bundled them together to create compelling solutions for customers, such as our collaboration pod and the data center, or even what we're doing with IP office and networking in the mid-market. What you may also not know is that we have an incredibly broad portfolio of networking capabilities. We have data center switches, core switches, distribution switches, edge switches, wireless LAN, identity and BYOD solutions. And so we really are an Indian network provider. And I would say that most of you know, the bread and butter of what we do in the networking space comes off of this set of products. We also, throughout our you know, legacy and various acquisitions and integrations into Avaya, have deployed the second most number of Ethernet ports all time. Now that's really important to us because one, it gives us a very large install base and a lot of customers to talk to that really give us great ideas of you know, how do we innovate, how do we help them solve their next generation of problems across pretty much every major vertical that you can think of. We're also an industry leader in fabric technology. You were here a number of months ago to hear about our fabrics. You're gonna hear a little bit more about that as well, but shortest path bridging is the core of the technology and the foundation of what we do. We've authored a number of drafts in the IEEE and ITF to help drive that standard across the industry. And we've really innovated on top of that. What you may also not know is that we provided the networking background, uh, networking backbone for Interop for the last two years running. So we did a fully virtualized network there and have been uh, selected several times to do that both in Las Vegas and New York. And then finally, we actually built the network for the Vancouver and Sochi Olympics. And so I'm gonna transition into that and tell you a little bit about what we did at Sochi because it really is a showcase of what our technology has. And I think hopefully is, is you know, on the grandest stage really provides you with some insight into not only what we did, but ultimately when the other come up here and speak kind of how we did it. So everyone's familiar with the Sochi Olympics. Uh, several billion people actually watch on TV. I think 
you know, probably the London Olympics in Sochi was the first time where as many people viewed the Olympics online as they did on television. And so that was really interesting because it really changes how you need to build a network for the Olympics. It's not just a self-contained thing, right? It really is the gateway for people to consume content from the Olympics, whether it's video, streaming video, media, news articles, interacting with friends, families, athletes, et cetera. And so it was quite a challenging environment. Now, I'm not going to go into all the details of what we built. You know, at a high level, you could say, okay, so we built a really big network. A lot of people build really big networks. You know, congratulations. It's really not that exciting. But actually, it was because when you think about it, we didn't just, if you re rewind back to, say, Olympics two years ago or even four years ago, many networks were built to host the Olympics. And as you can imagine, just like the rest of the world, uh, you know, many systems are becoming more IP enabled. So as an example, the timing system ran over our network. The video surveillance system ran over our network. The wireless system ran over our network for guests, users, media, et cetera. We didn't build seven or eight different networks. We built one network that was fully virtualized that ran all of the services flawlessly and seamlessly across the infrastructure. That's critical because you can imagine with security being what it was, the video surveillance you know, network needs to be a 24 by seven operation. It's extremely critical as does the timing system. You can only imagine the international disaster that would occur if the timing system didn't correctly log and register athletes times as they cross the finish line. All of that was done over one converged network. Now, we learned many things between doing the Vancouver Olympics and the Sochi Olympics. I think even if you rewind four years ago, while wireless was pretty predominant, it wasn't quite like it was today where it was like air, right? You, you wouldn't necessarily four years ago go to a public venue and go, gosh, they don't have wireless. This is a disaster. I will never you know, attend an event at this place again. Today, we kind of have that mindset, right? You wouldn't go to a big public venue and them not to have wireless, right? It would just be you know, very odd and out of place. So wireless really became mainstream. The other thing that became mainstream was not built, as I mentioned, not building separate networks, but physical network. One physical network that was fully virtualized, had security built in, end to end, that could run many different services. And so we really took a major leap forward, not only in networking technology, but how we thought about wireless and deploying wireless. Now, I mentioned that wireless uh, was mission critical. So one of the things that we did with our technology, and as I mentioned, you're going to hear a little bit more about this later today, was look at applications and really think about, so what are people doing when they're at the Olympics uh, from an application point of view? So what the graph on the right shows you is bandwidth spikes during the closing ceremonies of the Olympics. And then the text at the bottom kind of gives you a time frame of what was happening. And what you can see is that when interesting things were happening at the Olympics, the bandwidth on the wireless network spiked up fairly significantly. The graph on the lower left actually shows you the applications that were being used during this. Now, I don't know about you, but when I first saw this, my first reaction was Dropbox and iCloud? Like, really? Like, why would people be uploading things with Dropbox and iCloud when you've paid good money to attend the Olympics and in particular the closing ceremony? Most people, when I ask, I say, hey, guess what the top two applications are? I get Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Skype, FaceTime, you know, a bunch of stuff like that. And they're on the list. They're a little bit lower down. The point of this is, is what was actually happening, as, as you might imagine, is that when people are viewing the Olympics and taking pictures with their smartphones, their smartphones are automatically uploading their photos to iCloud or Dropbox, Pen, whether you have an iPhone or an Android device. Now, that's somewhat intuitive after you hear it. But what's really happening in our environment now, whether it's at the Olympics or even in a conference room like this, is our devices are doing many things on our behalf that we're not always actively trying to get them to do, right? You know, when we're taking pictures at the Olympics, we're not thinking, gosh, I can't wait till that photo gets uploaded to Dropbox, right? We're glad that it happens so that when we go home, we can download it, we can, you know, put them in photo albums and things like that. But we're not actively thinking about that. So the more and more CIOs I talk to, the more excited they get about having deep packet inspection and application control built into the infrastructure so they can understand what's going on, whether it's an intended use of their user or a secondary use of their user that they're not thinking about that really does affect the user experience. So this is just kind of one thing that we learned. Now, what you're going to hear about really 
And it's kind of in our DNA here at Avaya is we really think a lot about user experience, right? Whether it's user experience at a contact center or user experience with a unified communication equipment. But all of these applications, whether they're those things or others, really are to deliver a user experience and an improved productivity within an enterprise. And so user experience is really critical to us. We think about this in several ways, which is what are the users and devices that people are accessing the applications? What are those applications and how do you actually prioritize what they're actually doing in the network to make sure that business critical things you know, get the highest priority and other maybe social games, other things you, know, you can control or manage. And then finally, kind of what is the network capacity? A lot of times when you hear about wireless, you just hear about, oh, wireless capacity, and that's critical, obviously, with the industry's move to 11 AC. You know, bringing more capacity over shared wireless is critical. But the question is, is, is your network ready for 11 AC? Not just your wireless, but is your network ready for 11 AC? Have you done all the things for the network? And that's ultimately what Paul and John are gonna talk about is building a network that is ready for 802.11 AC. <clears throat> now, our fabric technology, as I mentioned, really is at the heart of what we do. And it's kind of the pyramid at the top of the pyramid in our overall architecture. So you're gonna hear a little bit about various layers of our architecture from access points to what we do in radio technology to application control, QoS and things like that. But we're really gonna start with what we're doing with fabrics and software defined networks to lay the foundation to build a truly unified network. So let me just step back for one second and I think if there's anything that you remember from kind of my opening speech here is I think the, the first major innovation we've done really is high performance application control to let IT administrators really understand and control what applications they have over their critical limited wireless bandwidth. The second is, is that we've built an architecture that really is optimized. It's a two-tier controllerless architecture that's <clears throat> optimized to truly collapse into the networking foundation or fabric that, that a customer is deploying. And then finally, we have created a number of innovations that allow access points and wired and wireless to come together to fully automate the provisioning and deployment of a network. 